Welcome to the 2020 Tejas Storytelling Association's Summer Concert. Now, don't be fooled by the summer part of that introduction. October, it is still summer in Houston and in most of Texas. We are so glad that you have joined us today. We have a wonderful, wonderful lineup of tellers. And we also are so privileged to have two of the American Sign Language interpreters, Libby Tipton and Joel Hill. And they will be signing with every story that's told. Now, when I think of a Texas woman, I don't necessarily think of big hair like the majority of the rest of the nation thinks. No, I think of someone who is smart, who is feisty, and who gets things done and has energy running out of her skin. Marianne Blue, our first teller, has a Texas drawl that even those of us who have never lived anywhere else but Texas have never been able to achieve. Mary Ann is a bilingual teller. She's had 40 years in the classroom and she's one of the original members of the Tejas Storytelling Association. She's also a recipient of the John Henry Falk Award, which is the most prestigious award given in the name of storytelling in the Southwest. She makes her home in San Antonio and she has worked extensively with youth tellers and some of her young charges will be seen in concerts during this conference. She's a performance artist and an event organizer and honest to gosh, she is just plain fun to be around. So please welcome Mary Ann Blue. Hello. It's so nice to see everybody. I'm not sure about that drawl thing. Sheila, we'll see about that. The first story I'm going to tell you is a North American folktale. And I've decided to set it in South Texas, where I live. So in South Texas, some people speak English and some people speak Spanish. So this story will have some of both languages in it. In a small town in South Texas, there lived a man by the name of Aaron Huesos. In English, Aaron Bones. Aaron Huesos was tall. He was the tallest man in town and Aaron Huesos was skinny, flaquito. Aaron Huesos was so skinny that he was really nothing but skin and bones. And Aaron Huesos had a problem. It was a nervous condition and when people would look at him in the eye, his knees started knocking and his ribs started rattling and his teeth started chattering away. It was clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack bones. That's what they called him, clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack bones. Now, Aron Huesos, clickety clack, he was in love with a little girl by the name of Berta Martinez. And Berta loved to go shopping. And Clicky Clack would wait outside the door. And when she would come out of the store, he would take her bags and he would carry them home for her. And she would say, Gracias, Clickety Clack. And his knees started knocking and his ribs started rattling and his teeth started chattering away. They called him clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack bones. Now there was somebody else in love with Berta Martinez. That would be the fiddler man, El Violinista. Now the fiddler man would love to sit on 
Bertha's front porch and he would play fiddle songs so pretty. But Bertha, she kind of liked clickety clack. She thought when he would start clickety clacking, she thought he was just so cute. And finally one day, clickety clack and Bertha, they got married. And in no time at all, there were one, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. Clickety clackers, clickety claquitos. And things went along just fine. And one day, Clickety Clack was coming in from the garden. He'd been working, it was hot. He stepped up on the porch and all of a sudden, his knees started knocking and his teeth started rattling and Clickety Clack fell down dead. Oh. Never was there a more mournful sign than when it passed from lip to lip in the town that Clickety Clack Huesos was dead. Oh, everybody in the town came out to the cemetery. And even the fiddler man was there and he played a, what some people thought was a little bit too happy of a song over the grave of Clickety Clack. And afterwards, the family went home and the fiddler man went home with them. And they sat down to supper. And the fiddler man sat down in Clickety Clack's chair. And when Bertha brought out Clickety Clack's favorite dessert, Pastel de tres leches, the three leche cake. The door flew open and there was clickety clack. Now I'm not talking skin and bones clickety clack. I'm talking skeleton clickety clack. Now you might wonder, well, how did they know it was clickety clack if he was a skeleton? Well, his knees started knocking and his ribs started rattling and his teeth started chattering away. Bertha said, clickety clack, you're dead. What are you doing here? He said, I don't feel dead. No me siento muerto. She said, you are dead. <laughs> you have passed away. He said, I don't think so. She said, you are, you are dead as a doornail. You have bought the farm. He said, I have not. She said, you have to. You are stone cold dead. You are graveyard dead. You are day of the dead dead. He said, well, I just came back for some of your pastel de tres leches, pastel de tres leches, dame un pedazo de pastel de tres leches. And he was dancing on the ceiling, he was dancing on the floor, he was dancing on the walls, he was dancing through the door. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack bones. Bailando por aquí, bailando por allá, bailando por arriba, bailando por abajo. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack huesos. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack bones. Well, this went on night after night. Noche tras noche. Clickety clack would wait. Bertha would bring out the cake. The door would fly open. Clickety clack would start to dance. Now Bertha and the fiddler man, el violinista, they really wanted a nice, calm evening, quiet, without clickety clack. And the violinista had an idea. So the next night, when he came to dinner, 
he brought his violin. And as soon as she brought out the cake, the door flew open and there was clickety clack. Bailando por aquí, bailando por allá. Pastel de tres leches, pastel de tres leches. Well, the violinista, he picked up his violin and he started playing really fast. Well, clickety clack, he had to dance faster and faster in the violin. Nisa, he was playing faster and faster, and before long, pop! Off came one of the, one of Clickety Clock's fingers. But Clickety Clock, he kept dancing, and the violinista, he kept playing, and before long, pop! Off came one of Clickety Clock's arms, but that didn't stop him. He kept dancing, and the violinista, he kept playing faster and faster, and pretty soon, pop! Off came, off came his head. It fell right on the floor, and there was Clickety Clack looking down and looking up at the same time, mirando por abajo y arriba a la base. But that didn't stop the violinista. He kept playing, and Clickety Clack, he kept dancing faster and faster and faster, and pretty soon, pop, 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 pop. There was Clickety Clack, a pile of bones. Un montón de huesos. Quick, they got the tablecloth and they wrapped Clicky Crack up in the tablecloth and they carried him out into the backyard and they buried him beneath the long swinging limbs of the live oak tree. Not too long after that, Berta and the violinista were married. And most evenings, when she would bring out the pastel de tres leches, those three little clickety claquitos, they would go over to the door and they would look out in the backyard and they would listen. Ah! They would hear him out there in the backyard. Smelling that pastel de tres leches, and they would hear him. Bailando por aquí, bailando por allá, bailando por arriba, bailando por abajo. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack huesos. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack bones. My brother Phil is responsible really for me playing the spoons. And Last Monday was his birthday, and in a couple of weeks, it will be the third anniversary of his passing. So it is during this time of the year that I think about Phil a lot. So I wanted to tell you a story about Phil. It was 1957, and Phil was at the height of his musical career. He was playing well, he was singing with a quartet called the Four Barons. They sang that intricate harmony doo-wop music. Some of you probably remember it. Don't know why I love you like I do. They wore white sport coats with pink carnations in the lapels and they when they sang. 15 year old girls would follow my brother home from school and fling themselves on our front porch. Phil was in heaven. And it was during that time that Phil fell in love with Gloria Jones, known to her public simply as Glow. Glow had platinum bleached hair slicked back in a Kim Novak duck tail. She had spit curls, tight sweater, tight skirt, and lots of eye makeup. She was a lot of girlfriend for a ninth grader. And it was during that time that my brother worked for my dad. My dad owned the 
Admiral Twin Drive-In Theater on Route 66 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ooh, the Admiral Twin right now during the time of Corona, it is a popular place. And, he, and back then it was too. Right now, it's open every weekend and every Monday night for Scary Movie Mondays. Go, man, go. It's not very far. Shake it on down to that cool snack bar. Come on, Jill. Give us a treat. A friendly pepper upper with a tasty beat. Drink Dr. Pepper, Doc, Dr. Pepper, cause it never lets you down. Frosty, man, frosty. Everybody in my family lived under what I call the influence of the silver screen. And I, was Debbie Reynolds. I hear the cottonwoods whispering above. Tammy, Tammy, Tammy's in love. My father was under the influence of Spencer Tracy in Boys Town. He had hired several boys as part of the Admiral Drive-In crew. And these boys, as my father called it, had had a brush with the law. So my father had given them a job and was going to get them on the right track. My brother worked with the Admiral Drive-In crew, too. And they were all under the influence of James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Now, they were experimenting with homemade tattoos, mostly dots and crosses and maybe initials. So my brother Phil decided he was going to tattoo glow onto his arm. Okay, now, friends, if I could see you, I would ask for a show of hands about how many of you have a tattoo. And some of you would raise your hand now because lots of people have tattoos, but this was 1957. Nobody had a tattoo except sailors and circus performers and members of motorcycle gangs. So my brother was going to have to be discreet about this. So it was a discreet tattoo. He got the India ink and the needle and he went to work. It was small block letters, G-L-O. Small enough that he could put his watch on top of it and our mother wouldn't see it. And things went along pretty well for Phil for about three or four days until Glow broke up with him. Yes, she left him with a broken heart and a glowing arm. Well, now... Phil's friend Gordy McFadden said you could take a tattoo off. He had read about it in a magazine and you just needed to use a needle and buttermilk. So Phil got some buttermilk and a needle and he went to work on it. Oh, that buttermilk stung so bad. So Phil decided he would change the tattoo. Now, today, people change tattoos all the time. You can, you can get rid of a tattoo with a laser, but it's still really painful, even without the buttermilk. Uh, and so a lot of people 
decide to change the tattoo rather than get rid of it altogether. Like Johnny Depp. When he was married to Winona Ryder, he had Winona forever tattooed onto his arm. How dumb is that? Well, after the divorce, he had it changed to Winona. From Winona forever to Wino forever. So Phil decided to change his tattoo. He was taking Spanish at the time, and he looked up in the, in the back of the El Camino Real Spanish book, and he saw that Lobo, L-O-B-O, in Spanish, meant wolf. Lobo. Yeah. He could live his life with Lobo on his arm. So he got it, the needle. And he got the ink and he started working and he added a B.O. onto the end. Now he just got the buttermilk and he was going to take off that G. But the G didn't come off. Now it smudged a little bit, but Phil was left with a Spanish word that doesn't mean wolf. Global. Balloon. Now, Phil is also not the last person to end up with a foreign word as a tattoo that you don't want to have. I looked this up. I did some research. And I found that Ariana Grande, and a lot of you probably don't even know who she is, but she is a pop singer. My granddaughter, Ella, loves her. And last year, she won a Grammy for Record of the Year, Seven Rings. And she decided to have seven rings tattooed in Japanese onto the palm of her hand. Well, let's just say that Ariana got some misinformation. She had the characters that she had put on her hand were she cheating but that doesn't mean seven rings she cheating is the name of a tiny japanese charcoal grill i kid you not so Phil was left for the rest of his life with Globo on his arm. He claims that our mother never saw it. He claims that it was months later when she was tipped off by the friend, by the mother of one of his friends. And our mother lived under the influence of just about every motion picture musical ever made. And I guess she thought that he didn't need any punishment, that living with a Globo tattoo was punishment enough. So she just walked into his room one evening and she said, Phil, and here's where she quoted a line from a song in an Irving Berlin musical, no business like show business. She said, Phil, a sailor's not a sailor till a sailor's been tattooed. And she turned on her heel and walked out. He, st he was stunned. And then it sunk in. She knew. Now Phil lived his life with that Globo tattoo and sometimes he'd look down at it and he'd smile. And when he'd smile, I knew he wasn't thinking about the botched tattoo and I, I knew he wasn't thinking about glow. When Phil would look down and smile, I knew he was remembering when he was at the top of his musical career, when he sang baritone with the four barons. They sang that intricate harmony, doo-wop music. Some of you remember it. 
Silhouette, 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 silhouette. Ah, two silhouettes on the shade. Whee! Thank you, Marianne. Now, does anyone out there besides me wonder if if Marianne has a tattoo, I bet she does somewhere that we might never, ever see. Let me mention that messages are coming in on the chat room. And if you have something sweet to say to us, I encourage you to use it because we're reading those messages and we appreciate them so much. Now, when I think of this next teller, I always think of a man with the flying fingers. And I mean that in the most complimentary way. If you have not had the pleasure of seeing Tom McDermott play the ukulele, you have missed a big treat. I personally have coveted his skill since the first time mm -hmm. I saw him play. And I'm not kidding about that because I play the ukulele, but Nothing compared to what Tom can do with that small instrument. Who even knew you could play classical music on a ukulele? I didn't until I saw him do it. Not only is Tom an outstanding musician, he plays lots of stuff. And he's a barrel of fun to listen to, but he's also a Methodist minister, a writer, a speaker, a husband, a father, a cyclist, and an outstanding storyteller. He was once introduced by our beloved Janine Passini Beekman as a Zen Methodist storyteller with a ukulele up his sleeve. That is so apropos. Please do welcome Tom McDermott to the stage. Thank you, Sheila. I appreciate that. I, I my, my uh, ukulele had a little bit of um, spinach, so it grew a little bit. I will bring the ukulele back in in just a bit, but I wanted to start off with a song. And um, it's a song that, that I learned from my uncle years ago. It's a great song to uh, kind of start off my little set here. One that some of y'all have heard me sing before. One of my favorite songs. And uh, started doing it at camp with kids who had cancer. Uh, it just, it turned out to be sort of a thematic song, an anthem for a lot of these kids who were learning how to use the ropes course. And they would uh, cry out the line in this chorus as they would uh, grab hold of the zip line and then just freely slide down hundreds and hundreds of yards out into the field from about 75 feet up. Uh, no fear whatsoever. So uh, here's a little song by Guy Clark. Well, he's eight years old with the flower sack cape tied all around his neck. Looking out over the garage and he's feeling, what the heck? Screwed his courage up so tight, well, the whole thing came unwound. He got a running start, and bless his little heart, he headed straight for the ground. Cause he's one of those who knows that life is just a leap of faith. Hold your breath and spread your arms and always trust your cape. He's all grown up with that flower sack cape tied all around his neck, tied all around his dreams. He's full of piss and vinegar and he's just busting at the seams. Stuck his finger up in the air, said it's gonna be do or die. Well, he wasn't afraid of nothing and he was pretty sure he could fly. He's one of those who knows that life is just a leap of faith. You hold your breath and spread your arms and always trust your cape. Always old and gray with the flower sack cape tied all around his head. He's still jumping off garages, probably will be till he's dead. And all his neighbors saying he's just been acting like a kid. 
But he did not know that he could not fly. So he did. He's one of those who knows that life is just a leap of faith. Hold your breath and spread your arms and always trust your cane. Said he's one of those who knows that life is just a leap of faith. You gotta spread your arms and hold your breath. Don't forget your cane. Thanks. So um, I want, my uncle taught me how to play guitar. And I learned as a kid, one of the things that I learned on, though, as I started growing up, was my uncle taught me uh, to play the guitar, play Merle Travis style. You can sort of, that, we call that walk-in blues or talking blues style. Um, but uh, at the same time, he got me a ukulele. Long story with that, but that's for another time. But um, he used to love to tell me stories and, and teaching tales. He told me this story. Turns out this is an old hoja tale, but he told it as a, he was a bluegrass musician and he told it as one of his friends. He said one day, one of his friends who had uh, been playing uh, the guitar for a long time decided he wanted to learn how to play a mandolin. And he said he, he wasn't very skilled at the guitar, but he, he was pretty sure he could pick up just about any instrument and play it with, with just a couple of lessons. So he went to a fine, skilled uh, mandolin master, mandolin teacher, and he asked the guy, he says, so how much is it gonna cost me for a mandolin lesson? And the guy says to him, he says, well, for the first lesson, it's going to cost 20 bucks an hour. And then for the second lesson and everyone after that, it's going to cost you 10 bucks an hour. So my uncle said, his friends say, great, then I'm going to start with the second hour. So he, he got himself a mandolin, took one lesson, paid his $10, and that was it. He took his mandolin into the town, sat down at the square, and started playing just this note on the fretboard of his mandolin. commotion in the square, people walking around, cars driving, but pretty soon this sound seemed to permeate every other sound, until pretty soon it dominated the aural specter, the aural sphere of that environment, until someone got up the courage, walked over to him, and muffled the string. Looked at him, scowled, and said, what are you doing with that instrument? And my uncle's friend said, I'm playing it. Well, they said, no, you're destroying it. You're beating it up and you're hurting all of our ears. He said, no, no, no. He said, I consider myself a master of this instrument. They said, how can you say that? I mean, we've heard fine mandolin players. They're playing these, they're playing the best bluegrass songs, the fastest bluegrass song, burning up the neck with these melodies. And all you're doing is playing that same note, that one note over and over. How do you explain that? My uncle said his friend looked up at the crowd and said, they're all looking for this one note.
Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so um, I want to share a sh short version of a story as uh, I kind of wrap things up here and maybe end with one last of my favorite songs. Um, when I was, when I was uh, just getting into the storytelling kind of world, uh, this was uh, probably back in the mid 80s, back when Finley Stewart was involved with it. And, um, and I, was, I was caught up in the, in the wanderlust of traveling. And I'd already been ordained as an elder in the, in the Methodist church. And so um, I'd started dabbling with storytelling and, um, you know, mostly going to libraries, bookstores, just getting my, my uh, tongue wet, so to speak. Uh, so I, uh, I, I had a chance to go up to Flint, Michigan. I'd never been to Michigan before. And so I, I went to, uh, flew into Saginaw. If you've been to Saginaw and Flint, you know just how, um, um, how flat it is. How, how sort of bland it is. And, and so I was, I was not really surprised. Uh, you know, I'd lived, uh, I've been out to West Texas. So I guess, well, I thought Michigan was a flat state. So I didn't really think much of it, except that I'd hoped to see woods and forests. And, but anyway, I was at Flint, Flint and I did a workshop and I finished the workshop. And, and I have to say the, the persona and response of some of the, uh, some of my, to some of my jokes and things it sort of felt like the landscape and I didn't feel really inspired and I was kind of feeling down on myself. And as the, as the, as the day ended with the workshop, I went to the facilitator who hired me and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to, where, where's the nearest kind of excitement? And he said, well, um, you know, I'm not much happening in Flint. And I said, well, what about some place to eat someplace nice to eat? And he says, well, you know, we got a Denny's that's kind of nice not too far out and they're just towards the edge of town. And I said, um, no, that's not what I'm thinking about. Uh, how far is Detroit? He said, well, Detroit's about two hours, maybe three, two and a half, three hours, depending on the traffic. It's easy to get to. You just head straight down the freeway, I-75, you get right to it. And he said, now it's, it's getting kind of cloudy. I failed to mention we were in the first week of November. He said, it's, um, it's getting kind of cloudy, but you, you know, it's not long and, and you, you could probably find a nice club there or someplace where you could get some music and stuff. And I said, well, what I'm really looking for is maybe a place where they're doing storytelling. And he looked at me kind of strange and he, and he said, you mean kind of like what you were doing today? Yeah, I wasn't sure whether to feel vindicated by that or not. <laughs> so I said, no, I, 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 yeah, storytelling, but you know, like a, like maybe like spoken word, maybe some music, spoken word, that kind of thing. It's like a coffee house. He said, well, like I told you, we got that Denny's. I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm thinking about. Um, I'll just head into Detroit. I'll find something. I said, but I don't have a rental car. You know, you guys picked me up. He said, well, there's a rental place right down the road here. I said, awesome. So I got to the rental place. It was just about to close. It was getting close to six o'clock, but he, he let me in and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just going to Detroit. I said, I don't need much. He said, well, then fine. I think we got just what you, what you might need. And I said, well, it's going to cost a lot. He said, well, if you don't need much, it's not going to cost a lot. And I said, all right. So he, he came up with some keys and walked me over to a car I'd never driven before, but I'd heard rumor of them. It was a Geo Metro. Little bitty two-door Geo Metro. I said, does this thing even run? He said, you didn't ask how much it would run. You just said, enough. And I said, all right. So I said, that's fine. He said, now I got to warn you. doesn't have a lot of pickup. It only has three cylinders. I said, is it broken? He said, no, you asked for just enough. That's what you got. So I said, thanks. And I, I paid the money up front and said, I'd have the car back to him in the morning. And then he told me again, the instructions, he, he reiterated the, what the other guy said. He said, just head straight down I-75. You can't miss it. You're going to head right into town. You get into Detroit, you're bound to find something to do. And I said, I said that's great because I'm looking for some kind of, you know, maybe kind of a, a place where they're doing storytelling. And, and he said, you mean like the library? And I said, no. And he said, well, that's good because the library's closed. I said, no, no, I'm talking like spoken word, you know, for adults. He said, do they do that for adults? I said, yeah. And he said, well, good luck. So I got in the car actually brought my ukulele with me because I always take my ukulele wherever I go. Everybody knows me, knows that it travels with me, whether I play it or not. And so it's in the side, it's in the passenger seat and I'm headed down Detroit, down to Detroit, down I-75. The traffic's steady, but, but full. When all of a sudden it gets so dark and a sheet of white just falls from the sky. It just is a snow blur, just a snow storm that just comes down. It's blowing all about and and 
cars are all, you see the red lights flashing everywhere. The red lights are just coming up and I'm from Texas and I don't know what to do. And I know that I'm not supposed to slam on my wheels when there's wetness or ice or, or, or freezing water. So I, I just slow down. It, it actually was a five speed. So that was good. I downshifted. And so I'm slowing down in the traffic and pretty soon it just comes to a stop. And, and seriously, whenever I have time, I just pick up a ukulele and I put my knee under the steering column and I start making something up. Well, the weather outside is frightful, but this uke is so delightful. And since I've got nowhere to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Anyway, I was learning that song because I thought I had time. And as I, as I start to move along, I realize I've been sitting for almost 45 minutes just dragging along. I look up to my left, I see some lights shining through the snow flurry. And I think to myself, well, maybe I just pull over, get a bite to eat at least. And then it will let up. I can make my way back down to Detroit. It turns out I'm pulling into Pontiac. Some of you know Michigan, you know where I am right now. I pull in and what do I pull into right across the street as I look at it, it's a Denny's. And I pull into Denny's and as I get out, I walk in, the waitress asks me what I'm doing. You know, she says, you're not from around here. I can tell by your accent. And I said, well, I'm actually headed to Detroit. She said, really? She said, well, you got a big storm out there. What are you going to do? And I said, well, actually, I was trying to find some storytelling. And she said, you mean like at the library? And you, I said, no. I said, I, no, never mind. I said, I'm just looking for a place that's got some music or something. And she said, you know what? You're from Texas. We got a kicker dance place right up the right up the hill here. You know, a great little a little of a place that you can do some dancing. And I said, never mind. Just let me get a burger or something. And sat down. And I guess she felt sorry for me because she came over after about 30 minutes. The snow was starting to let up, and she said, "You know, I've been talking to a friend of mine. You said you were looking for something to do in Detroit. There's a place called City Center, right in the middle of Detroit. It's beautiful, it, and it's a huge tower. Got all sorts of short stores, shops. It's got some clubs. Who knows what they might have? But you're definitely going to have more fun there than you are here in Pontiac." She said, "It's easy. Head straight down I-75. You can't miss it. It runs right into City Center." So I said, thanks. And I was so excited because even though it was now about 7.30 or 8, I thought I still got time. It was a Friday night. So I get in the car and I'm heading down. The snow's letting up. Things are feeling pretty easy. And thankfully, the directions were exactly as described. I landed right into Detroit. I went right down until it turned into a massive boulevard. And then I went driving right straight towards these beautiful tall buildings, including a big glass structure that must have been city center. It was all lit up and beautiful. And as I came to the T where the intersection was, I took a right and I could see very clearly with all the traffic still, I had to quickly get over to my left lane. There were two lanes turning left in order to get into the garage parking beneath the city center. So I quickly maneuvered in a bit of a panic, got in the right left lane, the rightmost left lane. Both lanes were turning. Suddenly, as I started to turn under the light into that other street, I noticed the leftmost lane went into the parking garage. The right lane that turned left went straight down a little hill in into a tunnel, the last thing I remember seeing over the tunnel was, welcome to Canada. Now, I've never been to Michigan, but in my mind, Michigan is south of Canada. How do you head south and end up north? I was so disoriented and confused, but there was no way out of the tunnel. I started going under the tunnel, following it along. It must have been 10 minutes under this tunnel till I get up on the other side. Now, this is pre 9-11. I think it was 1999 or even 2000. But as I came up on the other side, I kid you not, I was lost. I came up and I stopped at the customs and there's everybody in line. I could see a whole line of cars all the way across. And I finally get up to the customs agent and I, he says, well, sir, what are you here for? And I said, I really don't know. I'm kind of lost. He said, you're lost. He said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Texas. And he said, whoa, man. He said, you are lost. I said, no, no, no. I said, I was in, I'm in Michigan. He says, well, all right, that's a start. And I said, well, no, I mean, I was here to do a job. And he said, in Canada. And I said, no, I'm, I'm in Flint anyway. I said, I'm just trying to find a place where there's like a club and someone told me I could go to Detroit, you know, maybe where there was like some storytelling, spoken word. And the guy looked at me and said, you mean like at the library? I said, no, I said, no, I said, I said never mind. He said, well, if you're looking for clubs, Windsor is, is chock full of them. He said, you'll definitely find some clubs here. And then he stopped me as he was about to let me in because you know, back then we didn't need a passport, just my driver's license. And he looked into the car and he said, hey man, is that a ukulele? And I said, yeah. 
He said, oh, my dad played a ukulele. I said, yeah, you want to see it? He said, no, go on. So I went on and I drove on and I hit the, uh, the main boulevard. He said, if I take a right, I would see some clubs and stuff. So I turn, it's 930 now. And I'm heading down this boulevard. I forget what they call it, Channel Road, because it's following, following along the channel between Windsor and Detroit. Uh, and as I'm driving along, I realize I've got to stop somewhere to do something. Maybe if I could even just find a bookstore or something so that I could take sort of a memento for this crazy lost trip and then make it back before it got too late, because I still had a speaking thing in the morning. So I'm driving along and I see a lit up building. It's a stone building, beautiful glass windows. There are cars out in front of it. It's 930. I think, all right, something's happening. And as I look, as I pull over into the parking lot, there's books. I can see it through the window, books on shelves. So I quickly get out of the car and I run into the first door and the door opens up into a hallway. And then next to that is another door, a glass door, kind of French pane type door. And it's locked, but I can see the books there inside. It's a bookstore. The lights are on. There's a purse on the counter, but the door's locked and I can't get it. I can't move it. I can't budge it. And so I'm really getting frustrated, as you can imagine. And as I'm trying to get this door open, someone comes up behind me, taps me on the shoulder and says, excuse me, sir, can I help you, young man? And I said, I turn around and I look, it's an old woman. And I said, I'm really sorry. It's been a long night. She says, well, what are you looking for? I said, well, it's a long story how I got here, but I'm looking for stories. Well, she, she shook her head for a minute and she said, you're looking for story? And I said, yeah. And she said, story. And I said, yes. She looked me up and down at what I was wearing, like I might have been a little bit awkwardly dressed or something. But she said, come with me. I followed her down the hallway to another room, like a coffee, a little cafe. There were about 30 people, 20, 30 people sitting in chairs, very quiet, listening to someone who was about to read from his book of poetry, it looked like. And then there were two other speakers that were sitting in a chair, in chairs next to the, sort of next to the wall, as if they're ready to get up and speak next. There was an empty chair, and rather than put me across the crowd, she sat me down next to this older woman. I'd say back then she was probably in her 80s, and she, and I, she looked up at me and smiled, and I looked down at her, and the woman who brought me in said, this is Mrs. Story. I said, excuse me? She said, this is Gertrude's story. Now sit down and be quiet. And the author, Gertrude Story, looked at me and she said, do I know you? And I just shook my head and smiled. I said, no, this is really an accident. And, and as I was trying to explain, the gentleman who was about to read cleared his throat and he said, excuse me. And I, I got real quiet. He opened up his book and he said, I'd like to read my third collection of poetry. And for my first selection, I'm going to read a poem entitled Whatever happened to Jane Giroux? Now, if you're from Texas or Oklahoma, you know Jane Giroux. She was a former Miss America. She moved to Fort Worth, Texas. She was an anchor woman in Fort Worth back in the 70s. And in the 80s, I knew her because she was still working with the church where I first had my job as an as associate minister. I sat with her many times up in the chancel. I knew her whole life story. I, I couldn't believe I was sitting here listening to this guy about to read a poem about somebody I knew. And I was trying to tell Gertrude that when the fellow stopped again and he looked at me and said, you're interrupting me. I said, I'm sorry, but I know what happened to Jane Jerome. And everyone got quiet, looked at me and awkwardly. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, but I know Jane Giroux. She was a former Miss America. She was from Oklahoma City. She came to, I told the whole story and then the divorce and then how life turned south for her, but how she found a way to pick up the pieces and make something else of her life. And, and then I said, and, and, I, and I started continuing. He said, would you please stop? I said, I'm sorry. He said, since you've told my story here, I'm going to read the next poem. And he flipped the page and started to read the next poem. Afterward, a Gertrude story got up and she read some of her story from a book that she entitled How to Saw Wood with an Angel. When the whole thing was over, the, the authors insisted that I join them for wine and for dessert. And in the process, Gertrude's story was laughing and hearing my story as she was telling me her own story of how she moved from her academics out into, out into um, uh, uh, Sask Saskatoon, uh, Sask well, now I'm forgetting where it is, but anyway, in Saskatchewan. And, and she, um, she was at least a good 12, 1500 miles away. I was at least a good 1500 miles away. And she laughed and smiled and she said, I wanna give you my book. 
how to saw wood with an angel. And I said, I love it. I love the essays. I love what you read. She said, but I want to sign something in the back. She wrote in the back and then she said, you read it later, gave it to me. And then we said our goodbyes. And, and as I got in the car, getting ready to drive back, it was about midnight now, but I opened up the back where she, or the front where she'd written an inscription. And it wrote, it said to Tom, a fellow traveler and storyteller who has now discovered there is always a story waiting around the next corner. So I, I think if I have the time here, I'll end with the last little song that is a James Taylor piece. And uh, thank you all for letting me be a part of the evening. Let's see what this is here. The secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. Any fool can do it, there ain't nothing to it. Nobody knows how we got to the top of the hill. Since we're only here for a while, might as well enjoy the ride. The secret of love is in opening up your heart. It's okay to feel afraid, don't let that stand in your way, Nobody, everyone knows that love is the only road, since we're only here for a while, might as well show some style, give us a smile, isn't it a lovely ride? We're just gliding down and sliding down. Try not to try too hard. It's just a lovely ride. The thing about time is that time isn't really real. It's just your point of view. How does it feel to you? Einstein said we could never understand it all. Planets spinning in space, that smile upon your face. Welcome to the human race. Isn't it a lovely ride? We're just gliding down and sliding down. Try not to try too hard. It's just a lovely ride. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. James Thanks for letting Taylor, me be here. James Taylor and Guy Clark, two of my very, very favorites. You can't go wrong with those guys. Two good people. <laughs> good people, I'm telling you. Well, you were I'm guessing you knew going. James Rowe, oh. too. <laughs> well, we enjoyed it. And the, Thank you. The comments are coming in, and people are loving you, and they love, uh, they love uh, Marianne Blue as well. And if you have comments for us, please get in the chat room, and because we're reading them, and we want to hear all about it. Now, I'm not sure who's going to come out on stage next because our next teller is a shapeshifter. Now, try to say that six times without stepping on your tongue. I think tonight, though, she's not going to be shifting her shape. Darcy Tucker and her husband are veteran museum educators with more than 50 years of combined experience teaching history at Colonial Williamsburg, our nation's premier living history museum. And if you have not had the opportunity to visit Williamsburg, put that on your to-do list, put that on your bucket list. It is well worth every minute you can spend there. Darcy is many things, including a trainer and a performer, a consultant, perhaps best known for her character interpretations. But like I said, she's not doing that tonight. 
Let's see what Darcy has in store for us tonight. Please welcome Darcy Tucker. Thanks, Sheila. Yes, I actually do spend most of my life pretending that I'm not me, pretending I'm someone else. But I decided tonight that it was time to give you a little scary story. So I know that a lot of you own a house. Maybe some of you are still saving up for a house. My friend from college, one of my best friends from college, Patty, and her husband went to graduate school, saved their money, decided that they would wait until after they had had kids before they would start their, um, they, before they would buy their first house because that way they would be able to buy something really good. And by that time, they both had jobs teaching in Massachusetts. And when they began looking for a house, they could not believe their luck. They found the perfect house. It was gorgeous. It was a late 1700s, early 1800s house, sat way high up on a hill. There was a long driveway lined with oak trees. The house had 13 rooms, which was a lot for a young couple with just two kids. But as they had it figured, Alice would have her own room. Micah would have his. They'd have their bedroom. Each of them would have their own office. There was room for a guest room and a home gym. They might even put in one of those home theaters. And besides that, they knew that they'd have to do a lot of fixing up. So they could rent out a couple of rooms to graduate students to make the money that they would need to fix the house up. And besides buying that house, such a great deal, they'd have enough money to do a lot of the fixing. I mean, actually, the house was such a good deal that they kind of wondered if it had been caught in an estate war or, or something. But at any rate, it was theirs now. So before they moved in, they did something really smart. They did something that Terry and I should have done before we moved into this house, and that was to get the floors refinished. They knew they were also going to have to have the roof done. They were going to convert at least two of those huge bedrooms into bathrooms with walk-in closets. There was a lot of work, but the first thing was the floors. And as soon as they had the floors done, they moved in. It was June 21st, the day they moved in. And that night, they slept on air mattresses, all four of them, because they didn't even bother to put the beds together. They just got all the stuff into the house, collapsed on the floor, and passed out. The next morning, June 22nd, the doorbell rang. And it was really early. I mean, it was, it was still dark outside. And Jim got up to see who was at the door, and Patty glanced at the clock, and it was 5.03. What kind of a person would ring somebody's doorbell at 5.03 in the morning? And when Jim got to the door and opened it, there was nobody there. He looked around, looked on the porch, looked down their long drive. There was nobody, and he thought, great, ding dong dash, welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> And went back to bed, and when they got up later, they didn't have pots and pans out or anything, so they just piled into the truck and went out to Denny's, and then they started looking for furniture. Remember, they'd been in an apartment, and they hadn't had enough furniture in the apartment to fill up a 13-room house, so they needed everything. They, um, they went first to yard sales. It was a Saturday, so they found all the yard sales they could, and they picked up things there. They, they got a great bedroom set for Alice at one, and they found a bedroom set for Micah, not the one they would want forever, but it was okay for Micah in the meantime, and um, found a nice rocking chair. They found a flea market and a, a gorgeous big brass candlestick that would look really good on the mantle in their new fire, in their, their living room, and, and then they uh, found a barn sale out in the country, and there was a portrait there. And she looked like she was made for that house. She was late 19th, early, uh, late uh, 18th, early 19th century, just the same time period as the house. And they just fell in love with her. The minute they saw that portrait, they knew that they had to have her. So they named her Aunt Nellie. And they put Aunt Nellie in the back of the truck with everything else they'd gotten that day. And when they got back to their house, the first thing they did was to drive a nail in over the fireplace and hang Aunt Nellie up and put that brass candlestick right underneath. And it just, 
it made the living room. There was nothing else in the room yet, but it just made the living room. And now remember, they were both college professors, so they had a lot of books and they were planning to put in built in bookshelves all through the living room and in their offices and they didn't have time to get all of that done. They just needed to be able to unpack the books because school would be starting soon. They already had some IKEA bookshelves. So they went the next week down to IKEA and bought a bunch more that would match what they already had. So they had four of those bookshelves in the living room and two of them in each of their offices and, and things were coming together. It was starting to feel like home. They'd been there about a month. In fact, they'd been there exactly a month. And on their month anniversary, month anniversary in the house, they decided that they would go out on the town. So um, Patty had asked around and she had gotten a recommendation for a babysitter, a young woman named Kate, who was this tall, studious, really trustworthy kind of a girl. And she arrived at the house and, and the kids liked her and everything was great. So they took off and went down into town and it was just like a first date. They had dinner, they went to a movie, they walked around looking in shop windows and they were almost giddy with it. It was just so nice to get out, just the two of them again. It was after midnight before they got home. And when they got home, the kids were there in the living room on the old sofa, still asleep. And Kate looked just terrified. And at first she wouldn't tell them what was wrong, but finally they got out of her that all evening long, she kept hearing the cabinet doors in the kitchen opening and shutting. And she heard footsteps walking around in the kitchen. And she had gone and checked several times and there was nobody there, but she knew what she was hearing and those cabinet doors kept opening and closing. So Patty took her home while Jim carried the kids upstairs and put them to bed. And uh, the next morning, July 22nd, the doorbell rang. And as Jim got out of bed to go and answer it, Patty looked at the clock and it was 5.03 a.m. And again, there was nobody there. Well, that was weird, but weird things happen in old houses. So several days later, Jim was walking through the living room and the sun was coming through the window at, at a kind of an angle maybe he hadn't noticed before. And as he passed by Aunt Nellie's portrait, he noticed horns. They hadn't seen horns on Aunt Nellie before. And he called to Patty and she could see them too. I mean, they were very faint. And they both knew that sometimes back in the old days, uh, artists would take old canvases and paint new pictures on top of them. And so maybe there had been a picture on that canvas before Aunt Nellie got painted onto it, but I, of what, a, a goat? I, but the, the horns, now that they could see them, they couldn't unsee them. Every time they walked past that portrait, they saw Aunt Nellie's horns. About a week later, um, Jim had taken the kids, he'd gone to the grocery store, and Patty was in the bathroom in the big clawfoot tub. She loved that tub. It was one of the reasons they decided to buy the house. And when she finished with her bath, she got out. And when she tried to open the door, it wouldn't open. And the doorknob wouldn't even turn. And she rattled it and she pounded on it. And it wouldn't open. And of course, her phone was in the other room. She couldn't get to her phone. So there was nothing to do but just wait until Jim and the kids got home. So she did. And it seemed like it took forever. But finally, she heard them coming in downstairs. She heard the door open and their voices talking and laughing. And she began shouting, help, help, help. I'm stuck in the... And the door of the bathroom opened all by itself. On August 22nd, at 5.03 in the morning, the doorbell rang. 
And this time, Jim grabbed a screwdriver on his way down because he had had enough. He wanted to find out what was malfunctioning with this doorbell. And he took off the plate and he looked behind the doorbell, pulled it out, and it wasn't even connected. The, the electrical wires that had been put in when the doorbell got put in had been cut and not recently. I mean, they were, they were frayed and oxidized. It was clear they had been cut for a long time. So there wasn't even power to that doorbell. It's kind of freaked him out. But he put the plate back on, he screwed it back on, and everyone was awake. <laughs> so they just started their day. It was later that same day that um, he was actually going through some papers. He was still, you know, going through boxes. They were unpacking. And he found a picture from his first date with Patty. He uh, pulled it out, he looked at it, and oh my gosh, the memories that it brought back and how young they looked. And he glanced up, he was sitting in the living room, and he glanced up and he saw Patty at the top of the stairs and he said, Pat, look, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. And he jumped up and he ran up the stairs, look, and he didn't see her. Patty, where are you? There was no answer. And he went and he looked in every single room upstairs. And she wasn't up there. Even though he had seen her up there just a second before. And then he went to the end of the hall and looked out the big picture window. And there she was way down at the bottom of the hill raking leaves. Several days later, they decided to have a, another night out and they tried to get Kate to come back and watch the kids and Kate was not interested in coming back. But they had heard about Sierra and um, everyone said how good she was. And so they got Sierra to come and the kids liked her just fine. But the same thing happened when they came home after their date. The kids were asleep in the living room and Sierra was looking really freaked out. And she said, all evening long, the cabinets in the kitchen kept opening and closing and that she heard people walking around. The other thing that was strange, and maybe it was because they were getting nervous about living in this house, but Alice became a slob. Now, that's significant because Alice was born a neat freak. I mean, from the time she could walk, she spent all her time putting things away. You know, it used to be a problem. They would try to find things and they couldn't find them because Alice had put them away. And now she was nine years old, but she kept her room spick and span all the time. But all of a sudden, there was always stuff all over her room. And it didn't matter how much Patty and Jim reasoned with her or yelled or whatever. The thing was, she kept denying that it was her. She would always say, I cleaned everything up. I cleaned everything up. When I went to bed, everything was where it was supposed to be. And when I woke up, it was all over my room. And that just, you know, really. She even said, maybe Micah's doing it. And they said, Micah's four. He's not going to be coming into your room and throwing your stuff around. But one weekend, the kids went and stayed with their grandparents and everything had been put away when they left. But when they got home, Alice's room was a disaster. And there hadn't been anyone in the house. And then it was September 22nd. And at 5.03 in the morning, the doorbell rang. Not long after the doorbell rang, 7.30 that morning maybe, all of a sudden there was a huge crash in the living room. And when they ran into the room, they found Aunt Nellie on the floor. Now, the weird thing is the nail was still there. Somehow she had jumped off her nail and she hadn't jumped off and slid down in which case her head would be towards the fireplace. 
and she hadn't jumped off and fallen face down. She had jumped off her nail, fallen down, and slid around so that the bottom of the portrait was next to the fireplace. And what's even stranger was that candlestick that had been in front of her, well, she had obviously fallen onto it because the canvas was torn from the bottom. It was torn up as though it had landed on top of that candlestick. But now the candlestick was sitting on top of the portrait, standing up. That's it, Patty said. That's it. There is too much weird happening in this house. So she got out her phone and she began Googling for mediums. And she actually found one. Ms. Sylvia. So she called Ms. Sylvia and said, you've got to come and check out our house. Tell us what's going on. There is so much weird stuff happening in this house. And Ms. Sylvia arrived two days later, long flowing hair, long flowing clothes. She smelled of patchouli and she wandered through the house from room to room, pausing dramatically, nodding sometimes, shaking her head other times. She touched one item after another and paused and lingered over some of them. Sometimes she would shudder, sometimes she would smile. They watched her all through the house. And when she had gone through the entire house, Miss Sylvia came back to the living room and said, it's haunted. This house is definitely haunted. So here's what you do. You get you a Siamese cat. Ghosts, they hate Siamese cats. You get a Siamese cat, your ghost will leave. That'll be the end of them. Where's my money? So they paid her and she left and they got on the phone and started calling pet shops, but nobody had a Siamese cat. It took them two more weeks before they could find a pet shop that had a Siamese cat. But finally they did. They found the cat. They brought it home. The first thing it did was to go underneath the couch and it stayed there for a day and a half, wouldn't come out. But finally, little by little, it began to explore the house. It sniffed at things, jumped up on things. Sometimes it would arch its back. The entire house that cat explored slowly, carefully. And when it had explored the entire house, that cat crawled back underneath the couch and curled up and waited. And nothing happened. And nothing happened. So finally, they all went to bed. They'd been asleep for a couple of hours when suddenly, near midnight, they heard, yeah! Crash, 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 crash. And running into the living room, they saw that all of those Ikea bookshelves, every one of them had been pushed over, books everywhere. The library had been pushed over, each of their offices, all the bookshelves had been pushed over. There were books everywhere. And it was midnight. And that was way too much to even think about cleaning up. So once they get their hearts jump started and they got the kids calmed back down, they decided they would go to bed and deal with it in the morning. And the next day was October 22nd. And at 5.03 in the morning, the doorbell didn't ring. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, by the way, is based on a true story. A college roommate of mine lived in a house, I 
they tweaked a lot of the details, but basically what happened in that house happened in my college roommate's house. So it's based on a true story. So thank you so much, Sheila, back over to you. Thank you, Darcy, my gosh. I hope you never went to visit that college roommate. That is so creepy. That would creep me out so bad. I, I didn't believe her. I didn't believe her, but when I asked her mother, her mother said, yeah, it's all true. Oh my gosh. Well, I feel perfectly safe because I have a Siamese cat. So there's no ghost in my house for Good. sure. Thank you, Darcy, so much. That was wonderful. You're welcome. We're getting lots of nice comments on the chat room. People are loving your stories. We've had wonderful storytellers, Marianne and Tom and Darcy. And we have one more teller tonight. It's our featured teller. And we, he will wrap up this first night of the Tejas Storytelling 2020 Conference. We're going to go out with a bang by presenting Paul Normandin. Paul lives in Austin, Texas, but he is Houston's Moth Grand Slam winner. Now that's big. If any of you all have ever gone to a slam concert, they are, uh, it's a very interesting concept and they're fun to go see. You gotta come up with your five minute story that has a theme and it has to have happened to you, whatever it is. Paul is many things. He's an ultimate Frisbee player. He's a husband, a father, and a longtime Sunday school teacher. He's the founder of Austin's Free Hug Day. And since social distancing has become a standard way of life for all of us, the free hugs are at an all-time low. So Paul is saving them up for us until the pandemic is over, and we hope that will be soon. Please help me welcome the man with the big mouth, and that's his words, not mine. The man with the big mouth, Paul Normandin. I am Paul Normandin, and I was born the firstborn son of a firstborn son in Providence, Rhode Island in 1962. And I don't remember it, but as soon as my grandparents were allowed by my mom, they took me home to their house for the weekends. They did this every weekend. And every single Saturday morning, my Mime, because it was Mime in Pipe, because they were from a small town north of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. And in their house, they only spoke Quebecois. She would put a little crown on my head and anoint me king for the day. Sunday was God's day, and we went to church, the Catholic church she attended, but Saturday, well, Saturday was my day. If I wanted waffles for breakfast, we had waffles. If I wanted ice cream for lunch, we had ice cream. If I said, let's go to the amusement park, we went to the amusement park. This went on for six glorious years. During that time while I was away on the weekends, somehow I got two younger sisters, Laura and Carol, there may be a correlation, but I was a kid and I couldn't figure that out. Now, when I was six years old, my dad had been working on a super special project. Turns out he was working on a contract with NASA and he was invited to be on the team to go down to Cape Canaveral and work on the Apollo project. This was a really big deal for my dad. I never saw dad during the week. He worked so much. And when he got off, he liked to go out with his friends and blow off steam. This was a thing that happened that we couldn't go visit with him. When we got to Florida though, all bets were off. My dad would get off work on the ship he was working on where he was a radar tracking technician for the Apollo project. And he would go to the bar. And in, in Rhode Island, you weren't allowed to go to the bar if you were a woman. You couldn't go into the pool hall. But in Florida, they like to keep families together. So they were encouraged to come. I know this because I often got to see my dad in these places. My dad was a very different guy there. He would have a beer in one hand and a cigarette in his mouth and a pool cue in his other hand and he would just rule in that space. Turns out my dad was a really good pool player, the kind of pool player people came from all around to try to beat. And after each time, 
usually somebody would give him money. He was an amazing guy when I saw him in this situation. I remember one of the rare times dad had a weekend off. We were driving down the coast of Florida and we were kind of checking out our, our environment. Dad was driving, mom was in the front seat and my two little sisters were next to me in the back seat. It was sunny and beautiful. And I saw an ice cream stand and I said, hey, let's have ice cream. And mom and dad were like, no, 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 that's not healthy. And I said, no, 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 no. Y'all, it's Saturday. King for the day. And when they stopped laughing, I stopped asking about it. it. Seems that was something we left behind in Rhode Island. In Florida, my dad was often not home because he was out to sea on this big giant ship tracking the Apollo missions. It was during that time when one of the neighbors did something horrible to me multiple times over a long period of time. When dad and mom figured it out, they stopped it. And dad took another job in Houston. I was a different kid at that point. People would ask me what I wanted to be when I was younger. And I would always say what my parents wanted, an astronaut or an engineer or a scientist. But in my head, I was thinking I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be funny. I wanted to make people laugh as, they took, as he took their money playing pool. But I did what I was told. And in Houston, I encountered this new world, this very big city and this very different environment. And I think sometimes my knees were clicking and clacking like clickety clack, because I was scared sometimes maybe a lot of the time. It was in Houston where mom was finally able to kind of have free time while the girls were in school and I was in school. I was in middle school, the girls were in elementary school and mom was finding her own feet. And it was, it was now acceptable for women to leave the home and go into the workplace even though they had children and were married. Dad and mom eventually started arguing. And I remember it was pretty ugly and pretty fierce. And when the semester ended that spring and it was summertime, my dad picked me up that last day of school and my two sisters in the car and all our stuff and we drove to Rhode Island. And there my dad dropped us off for the summer. He explained that he and mom need to work some things out and it was gonna be rough, but he wanted me to take care of the girls. Now I took that very seriously. And I did what I was supposed to do. When dad got back in the car and headed back to Houston, Texas, I watched over my sisters in this new environment where I knew the names, but I didn't know the people. And I was scared and jumpy and worried. And I did this for days until one day a little old man in a little old car started honking his horn and waving at me from the street. I immediately moved towards my sisters and I, I felt my aunt come running up behind me. She said, it's okay, it's okay, that's your Pipe. Mime and Pipe, your dad's dad and mom? Pipe's gonna take you somewhere fun today. I want you to go have fun and relax. I'll watch the girls. I had come to trust my aunt and I decided to get in the car with my Pipe. It was awkward on the drive and it was a very long drive. And when we arrived where we were going about an hour later, I was disoriented. Pipe got out of the car and there were just tons of people around and he walked up to a ticket booth and everybody knew his name, the name that Mime called him. And they were, they were talking to him, people just coming and talking to him and shaking his hand and giving him money. And he would write things down on a little pad he had and he'd stick it in his pocket. And then eventually with the tickets he had, we went inside up all these stairs until I realized we were in Fenway Park, home of the Green Monster and the Boston Red Sox. I was overwhelmed. There were so many people and so many things going on. But that summer, Pipe took me to 20 
Red Sox games in Fenway Park. And we watched every televised game that wasn't there at home in his living room. Pepe taught me everything I needed to know. Everything I needed to know about baseball that summer. He taught me about the Boston Red Sox and Fenway Park being the greatest in the world. He taught me about the American League being far superior to the National League. And he taught me about the evil Yankees. I did learn a lot that summer. I also was Pipe's lucky charm, as he called me, because the Red Sox were doing incredibly well. It was the summer of 75, and Red Sox that August were on fire. Right about the time my dad showed up, and Pipe and I were at a game because Pipe had forgotten dad was showing up. And dad was on a timeline and there was no cell phones or way to contact us. And by the time we got back, my dad was mad, not at me, but at Pipe. And they had words. I got in the car. My sisters were already in there. And as soon as we got in the car, dad started driving. I was excited about baseball. And I'm like, dad, we really shouldn't leave. The Red Sox are doing really well this year. They're probably going to go to the playoffs. They may make the World Series, dad. And dad cut me off. We really didn't talk about it much until the girls fell asleep in the back seat. And then dad explained to me that Pipe was never home when he was growing up. And he blamed baseball. And then he let on that Pipe was a bookie somebody who took money from people for gambling. And dad really looked, his, looked down his nose at this. That was the thing that dad didn't like, that his father was never there for him. I was a pretty precocious kid at the time and I'm checking off each box, drinking, gambling, never there. And I was shaken. And I couldn't find my voice to stand up to my father. On that very long drive back to Houston, I committed to never drink, never gamble, never smoke, and to always be there for my children. There was a little thing in my head that popped in that said, maybe there was a kid out there who needed me because of what happened to me in Florida. Maybe there was somebody who needed me. Maybe we could adopt. That's a lot for a, a little kid to be going through, but that's how I went home to Houston that year. When I got back, we started school, but we also started the playoffs not long after that. And those playoff games where Boston was playing were televised, so I could see them in Houston. And after every game, when the rates went down for the telephone, Pippa and I would talk on the phone about the game. And this was great, and it went well into October because the Red Sox really did do well that summer. So well, they made it to Game 7 of the World Series. I remember after that game, I was sad because the Red Sox had lost to the Reds, the National League winner, where they're inferior, letting their pitchers bat somehow won out the day. I was a little depressed and I was wondering why I had invested so much time in the Red Sox if they were just going to lose. My logical brain understood that all teams lose except the Reds this year and there's only one winner, but my emotional side just couldn't handle it. I really didn't care about baseball anymore and I really focused on school. It was in the winter that year, right around Christmas time, that Pipe called to let us know that Mime had passed away. I, I didn't think I could be any sadder. I, I just fell into a kind of depression, and I really didn't care about baseball. I was on the swim team, and I was doing well in school and passing all these advanced tests and getting accepted into the, these advanced high schools. and. I just didn't have time when spring training rolled around to put my mind to it. And I focused really hard on school and sports. 
I remember when the semester ended and summer started, it was really awkward with mom working and us kids not having any place to go. And so I was put in charge. And then July 9th came and we got a call that said Pipe was getting on a plane to come to Houston. You see, July 9th was the day that the Montreal Expos were playing the Houston Astros and Pippi had a plan. And when he got off the plane, he put his hand on my cheek and he said, I understand the National League plays here. And they did, the Houston Astros, yes. When we got to the stadium, it was 104 degrees and Pippi got to experience the greatest game of his life. We went inside he got free tickets. We sat on the eighth row till we moved up to the first row. It just so happens there was a promotion. He got free beer. He caught a foul ball from the pitcher, Larry Durker, who just happened to throw that night a no-hitter. And we were sitting right there, right on first base to watch the last play of the game. As soon as Pepe had caught that ball, he had given it to me, and I was squeezing it with a death grip in that moment. And as the game ended, I looked over at him, and I wondered if maybe Grandma was holding a crown above his head. Like all good things in that game, his vacation had to come to an end, and he had to go home, back to Rhode Island. And it turns out I would never see Pepe again but I had that ball. And when I went back to school, I worked really hard and I got into three different schools. I got into the high school that I was closest to physically. I got into the high school for performing and visual arts and I got into the high school for engineering professions. I wanted to go to the high school for performing and visual arts. I wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to be funny. I wanted to get on stage. My parents wanted me to go to the safe school, the school that my brain was cut for, that I was gifted for, that I was talented for. And in the end, they went out and I went to the high school for engineering professions. And when I got there, I worked as hard as I could. I decided if I was gonna study at this school, I was gonna be the best I could, but I wasn't because all the gifted and talented students were here. And I was just one of many and I wasn't the best. This was a new feeling for me. I remember I still wanted to do as well as I could and I worked as hard as I could all through high school. And when it was time to go and put in your college applications, I worked with a counselor and I decided if I was gonna study physics, I wanted to go to the best place in the world to do it, Princeton. And the counselor's like, well, you should have a backup school. And I said, okay, Rice, they have a great astronomy department. <laughs> The counselor said, maybe you should have a, a fallback school. And I said, fine, Texas A&M University. I had been there. They had a cool engineering program and they had a nuclear reactor. When the letter came back from Princeton that I was in, I was on top of the world. I was at a very competitive high school. I was at a high school where everybody bragged about their SAT scores and what colleges they were going to. And they were all going to fantastic places. And I could hold my head high that I was going to Princeton. When I got the letter from Rice, I called them up because they said, hey, if you're not coming, tell us so we can free up your slot. And I'm like, I'm, got, I'm going to Princeton. About two weeks before graduation, I guess my mom drew the short straw and she came up the stairs to my room and she told me that I couldn't go by myself to New Jersey. I was devastated. And somehow in that moment, I found my voice. All that resentment and anger, it just came flooding out. And I questioned why I'd even gone to this stupid school. My teenage life had spiraled out of position where it was supposed to be. I knew I couldn't argue with my mom and dad. And eventually I caved in and they took me up to Texas A&M University. And just to spite them, when we got there, I changed my major to philosophy. Neither one of my parents <laughs> graduated from high school, so they had no clue uh, what that meant. And they had to ask the head of the physics department to explain what that meant. I was mad. 
I was mad I was at the school and I was mad at what was happening. And my parents were mad at me. And eventually they cut me off. And I looked for how I was going to pay for college and how I was going to finish out what I started. What was I going to do to get out and get my degrees? I found the army. I went overseas. I saved all my money. And I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't do drugs. I didn't go out. I just was in the army. And I focused on what was in Europe that I could do and see. And it was there in Bomberg, West Germany, that I fell in love with art. They called it West Germany back then. I would go to every museum. I didn't understand a lick of German, but I would go to every museum I could find and I would look at the beautiful art and the amazing works. And I would just be amazed at how beautiful everything was. I was not an artist. I didn't know anything about doing or making art, but I was a fan. When I finally finished my tour in Europe and I came back home and I went back to, to school at AM, I had money. I had a, a program that the army was paying for to keep me in school. I was, I was working it out. I was going to make this work. And I graduated with an undergraduate degree and I got into graduate school. And my sister, my incredible sister, Carol, who puts me to shame at how industrious and smart she is, had decided to follow me to a and Why, I don't know, but she wanted to go where her big brother was going. I was blown away by this, uh, mostly because Carol was so smart and so amazing. I just assumed she'd go somewhere amazing and important like her. And I'm so grateful she came to a and because she had a friend, friend named Victoria. And I was over at Carol's house and Victoria came over I think she came over solely to tell Carol a joke. She walked in, she told the joke, she walked away and left the house. I looked at Carol and I'm like, did she just come in to do that? And she goes, yeah, I think so. I said, can you give me your number? I loved how funny Victoria was. Uh, we were very compatible very quickly. Everything in her house looked like art. Everything about her reminded me of art. She looked like a piece of art and she had a brain like a wizard. She was so smart and she could do things in her brain that I was jealous of about which ways to go and how to route in a map. And it just made me so excited to be around somebody like that. And on top of that, uh, both of us were Methodists like Tom McDermott. And it was one of those moments in your life where you're kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe. So I asked Victoria the big question. I said, children. And she goes, oh, I want to adopt. Then I knew. When Vicki graduated with an undergraduate degree, she moved to Austin for a job. When I graduated with my master's degree, I made a beeline to Austin to be with Victoria. I knew I wanted to do something that would help people. And so I went to work, surprisingly enough, for the agency in the state that was responsible for child protective services, the place you would go if you wanted to foster or adopt a child. That process was ludicrous. Vicki and I got married. <laughs> we bought a house. We decided it was time. And we went down there to talk to them. And honestly, the process took over a year, over a year of classes and waiting. So much time that Vicki and I finally decided we needed a vacation. And so we planned the vacation and that day we got the call. They had a beautiful little girl who needed an emergency placement. Her name was Cindy and she was six. And they said, can you do this now? And I said, well, we just scheduled our vacation. And they said, that's okay, we'll work around that. When we met Cindy, she was quiet, definitely around me. It turns out that what happened to me in Florida, it happened to Cindy. And she didn't like men. And I could appreciate that. I stayed a distance from her. And that first time we were ever alone, her, me, and Vicky, we were at a park. 
And I remember this so clearly because I wanted to impress Cindy. I wanted her to want me to be her dad. I had fallen in love with the kid. I'd only met her a few days. I just wanted to be there for her. I was teaching her to throw. I wanted to teach her to throw a Frisbee because I love playing ultimate and I love throwing Frisbees. And Cindy uh, could not wrap her hand around the disc. So instead I got a ball out, a little ball that she could throw. And we started to play catch. And every time Cindy threw the ball, she'd throw it way away from me and it would go flying over my head. And I would run like a golden retriever and chase the ball down and run back to her. While I was gone, Cindy would talk to Victoria. She wasn't talking to me, but she would talk to Victoria. And one time she said to Vicky, what do I call you? And Vicky had said, well, you can call me mom, or you can call me ma'am, or you can call me Victoria. That'd be okay. And she said, what do I call him? And she was pointing at me and I was back and I heard that. And I said, well, you can call me dad, or you can call me Paul, or you can call me bald, or you can call me bozo, or you, and I just started saying funny things. And my wife is looking at me like I'm crazy. And this young girl stopped me at bozo. And she said, can I really call him bozo? She wasn't looking at me. She was looking at Victoria. And Vicky's like, well, I I guess if he says it's okay, you can do that. Trying not to sabotage where I was going with this. And I came in and I, I got a little closer to Cindy. I didn't want to scare her, but I said, listen, Cindy, the one word I don't want ever have you call me is sir. I don't like it. And it's not what I want to hear. Okay. And she said, okay, bozo. And from that day forward, Cindy and I, I would try to do everything with her. If she had an interest, I was trying to do it with her. And when Cindy hit middle school, after we adopted her, we, we saw her talent shine. It turned out I was taking her to all these art museums. I was trying to show her all these things. If she showed any interest whatsoever, I wanted her to do it. I was there for every volleyball game. I was the loudest person in the stands, which sometimes got me in trouble. Uh, Dad, don't embarrass me. Um, but in middle school, she got an art teacher and that art teacher really encouraged her. And I had taught her about artists who stole their other, their other people's styles and adopted them for themselves and incorporated them into their work. And Cindy met one of my artist friends and she, incorporated his style into her work. In eighth grade, Cindy won every award you can win in, in, in Austin. And she even got published, something I was a little jealous about because I had never been published in college. And here my little girl was in middle school getting published. And I was so proud and I was so happy that we had found this thing with Cindy. And after she got all those awards and all those accolades and all those people telling her how great she was, my little artist daughter said she never wanted to do art again. <laughs> my heart was broken. I wanted her to be happy and I couldn't figure out why, why would she not do this? Not long after that, she read a book called The Devil Wears Prada. And I read it because Vicki and I would always read the book she was reading. We would, we would trade off one versus the other. And that was my book and I read it and I fell in love with it. And when the movie came out, I took Cindy to see it. And I immediately went to the store and I bought a copy of Vogue, which is what the, the story is about. It's about the people who run Vogue. And I got Cindy to sit down with me on the couch and we got markers. And she got a yellow one and I got a pink one. And we, we marked each page that we liked, whatever the art was. It meant that if we weren't together sitting on the couch, it was okay. We could mark the book up on our own. And, and the September issue was pretty big, but we went through it and I was getting quite an education on fashion art. And in the process, Cindy and I were getting a little closer. And in the process, 
Cindy was seeing the beauty of art again. And I was optimistic, not trying to push too hard, but hopeful. And I remember that she had picture day coming up. And I thought, you know, it'd be really good. We, my wife and I work for the state and we, we don't have a lot of money. We're not like Carol, the millionaire out in California who owns her own company and lives on top of the world in Laguna Beach. But I thought maybe I could get her one piece of fashion. Cindy didn't like going into the big stores like Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom's. So I took her to a little boutique and we went at an off time. And I saw in there something that we had seen in the magazine. And I said, honey, would you wear this for picture day? And she said, yes. And I bought her this piece of fashion and she wore it for picture day. And I remember when she came home from school that day, I wanted to talk about how it was. How did it go? And I said, did anybody talk to you about the blouse? And she's like, yes. And I said, did you wear it for picture day? And she's like, yes. I said, that's great, honey. I feel like you're one of those people in vogue. Cindy didn't start doing art again and it didn't quite work the way I had hoped. But that Christmas, we were gonna go out to California to visit my sister and her family. They were doing really well. And we wanted to go to this fancy place where she could watch the sun set over Catalina Island every day. And I was a little intimidated. I've always been a little intimidated by my sister. I think that's a, a truth I have to live with. But I didn't want Cindy to feel out of place. You see, I had found that shirt stuffed in a little paper bag underneath her bed. It had been months that she had it hidden there. It turns out all she wanted to wear at school was Abercrombie and Fitch, like all the other kids. She didn't want to be called out or identified. And I should have known that, but I failed. And now I was thinking about taking us to this beautiful church in Laguna Beach, California for Christmas Eve services. And I didn't want Cindy to stand out. So I knew what she needed to wear. I had been studying these magazines. I knew what to get her, but I couldn't do it without her buy-in. I couldn't get her to go to Neiman Marcus. I couldn't get her to go to Nordstrom's. I couldn't get her to go back to the boutique. So we went to Goodwill. And I scoured that little store looking for something until I honestly found one of the fashions that you would get at Nordstrom's. I, I, I recognize the brand. And when I checked the size, it was Cindy size six. And I knew this was the kind of thing my sister wore. So I thought maybe this will work. I got Cindy to try it on. And when she came out, I looked at her. And I thought I was looking at somebody from Vogue magazine. We did go out to California that winter. Cindy was still struggling with all her anger issues and she was struggling with who she was, but she had agreed to wear the dress for Christmas Eve at the church. And that's all that mattered to me. When we got out to California, my sister Carol really is a saint. She had cleared out her master bedroom of her and her husband. They were going to stay somewhere else in the house, and we were going to have her room. Sometimes I hate my sister because she's so nice and so awesome. And I remember I was giving her a hug and just so grateful to be in her presence and be with her. As Cindy walked in, now, Cindy was bringing in the stuff from the car because the rule was you had to bring your own stuff in. And at the front of what Cindy was carrying was that dress in the dry cleaning bag. And my sister Carol saw that dress and she ran over to it and she pulled the bag back and she pulled the, the, the sticker out and she looked at it. And she goes, size six. And she turned to me and she said, is this my Christmas present? And my face must have turned bright red. And I, I felt really embarrassed in that moment. And I wanted to make my sister happy, but I was thinking, oh, this is, this is not going to go well. 
when I hear Cindy say, yes, Auntie Carol, this is your Christmas present from me. In that moment, I was smiling. I wanted to be mad at my daughter for what just happened, but I couldn't be. She had done something that any father would be proud of. We recognized how, how much trouble Cindy was in as she graduated from high school and had a complete break with reality. She went onto the street and it was a struggle to keep her off the street. Eventually we had to put her into a mental institution. And it just worked out that I was the one who was gonna to have to drop her off. My world was shattered. I was devastated. I felt like a complete failure as a father. The one thing I thought I could do well. When I dropped Cindy off in Michigan at the facility she was gonna to go to, I had to come home and all my friends had done an intervention with me to tell me that I needed help because I was so depressed and they weren't wrong. I was. When I met with the therapists and the counselors and talked to everybody, they said, you need to take a class. You need to go do something. You need to fill the void that you're feeling with your daughter gone from your life. I didn't know if this was the right thing or to do or not, but I dutifully did what they told me to do. And I wandered in to the Hideout Theater in Austin, Texas. I was 48 years old. I wasn't like any of the other kids that were in this space. And I sure as heck didn't think I was funny because I was so sad. But after that first class, I was sweating I had been laughing so hard, my belly hurt. I had had the best time I could imagine. And even for a few minutes after, I was happy. I committed to doing the classes and I started doing the classes. And the next thing I know that led to shows. And I was doing really well at this. And I kept thinking about my daughter back at this institution and how she wasn't doing well. And I, I struggled with that reality, that duality of who am I that could go and do this while she is struggling. And every show I performed in, Victoria came. It turned out maybe Vicky was getting some laughs that she needed too. And I wasn't really there for Victoria at that time because I was dealing with me. And over time, Vicky would attend these shows. And after each show, I would come off the stage. And if you've ever performed, you probably had this feeling once or twice where you come off the stage and you are convinced you were terrible and nothing can convince you otherwise. And Vicky would come up to me and she would say, great show, honey, you were so funny. And I would fight that. I would just fight that. I didn't know how to deal with what was happening to me. And I was becoming an artist, just like my little girl. And I didn't want those accolades and I didn't want those kindnesses. I just wanted to be better. Always trying to be better. So Vicki and I worked out a little, a little thing. It was something that had come up in our life before. And so after every show, I would come and find her and she said, you're not funny. And then we would talk about the show. Over the next few years, I started getting invited with my troop in our prime. I had I'd found some other people over 40 and we formed a troop and we thought in our prime was a funny name. And we started traveling to comedy festivals all over the country. I had written a little story in my head to kind of cope with what was happening to me. And the story went something like this. I'm not any good, but Ryan and Jessica and Gloria are brilliant and they're funny. And I could set them up to be really funny in the shows. And we could bring drama because I was still kind of depressed. And I could bring sadness and we could find our way out and make it something special. Not like a comedy show, but like a, a sitcom. And it worked. We kept getting invited all over the country. And I kept running this dialogue and Vicky kept saying, you're not funny. And then we talk about the shows. We traveled to Hawaii and New York 
Seattle, even Oklahoma. I remember we were in Washington, D.C., and we got our name on the banner outside the theater, and we were very excited to be there. And it was one of those times in your life where you're on the verge of realizing maybe you're not just a project manager for the state of Texas. Maybe you can be more than just that one thing. Maybe I wasn't a failed father only. And maybe I could be more than that thing. That Friday night, after Vicki and I had gotten there a week early and toured all the art museums that they have in Washington, D.C., we did our show. And for the very first time that I can remember, I stepped out on the stage to start a new scene. Jessica and Ryan went to the wings, and I looked at Gloria to bring her out, and I set a line. And there was nobody else on the stage. And the 200 people in the audience just broke out in laughter. There was so much laughter that I I double checked to see if maybe Ryan or or Jessica had come out and they hadn't. And then I checked in with Gloria who had stepped into the scene and she was looking away because she couldn't stop laughing. I didn't know what to do in that moment. In improv, you're, you're taught, don't think about it, just be in the moment but I had to figure out what was happening. And when I saw her laughing, I realized, well, maybe I, my line was funny. The show ended and everybody loved it. We went out and we just had the best time that night. And it was so fun and so wonderful. And Vicki reminded me I wasn't funny. And the next day our workshop sold out and the next day the festival ended. And I'm that guy who can't leave a festival without thanking everybody involved. And so I ran around trying to find everybody. And I couldn't find the last producer. And Vicki and I had to get to Baltimore for our flight. And so we were just going to leave without saying goodbye, which hurt my heart. I didn't want to be that guy. We got in the car and we started to drive away from the theater. Vicky's in the passenger seat and I'm driving, and I look over at Vicky, and out the window, I see Brittany, the last producer. She's standing on the, the sidewalk talking to somebody. So I pull right back over in the next block. I roll down Vicky's window and I yell out, thank you, Brittany, so much. I had a wonderful time. And the woman she was talking to did not turn around. She just said, oh my God, is that Paul Normandin? of in our prime. My wife's head hit her chest. And this woman came running over and she just told me how funny I was and how great our show Friday night was and how much she adored me and how grateful she was for the workshop. It felt like it was an hour. It lasted about 30 seconds. I put Vicky's window up and we drove away and we were a couple blocks at a red light and the light started to change. And as it did, I heard my wife very clearly say, you realize that woman wasn't at your show Friday night. And I was trying to understand what was happening because I had heard everything the woman said and I I, I wasn't sure where I was driving. So I finally looked over at Victoria And I said, how could you possibly know that? There were 200, she goes, because you're not funny. I should have checked the mirror at that moment to see if there was a crown on my head. Thank you all very much. Sheila, back to you. Wow. I love family stories, but that one was a doozy. So well done. Thank you so very, very much. That was terrific just terrific. I'd like all the tellers to come out now so we can give them a big hand. Then they do great. And I'd also like to thank Libby Tipton and Joel Hill for signing all the stories. They always do such a great job. We love them so much. Is everybody out here now? Let's give Libby and, and Joel a little big old hand. Thank you all so much for being here. Hadn't it been fun? 